Welcome to the Deep Dive. Our mission today is uh, a full immersion into the Metallicus ecosystem. We're focusing heavily on XPR network. You might know it by its old name, Proton. That's right, big rebrand there. Exactly. We've gone through a ton of sources, technical docs, strategy papers, market analysis, basically. We did the homework so you don't have to. Yeah, and it's quite a stack. It really is. We're looking at, well, a huge ambition here. They're aiming to build what they call the world's first digital asset banking network. That's a very specific phrase. It is, and it signals exactly what they're after. Fixing those, you know, those painful friction points between old school finance, TradFi, and the DeFi world. So bridging that gap. Completely. Our sources hit everything from the uh, the nuts and bolts tech stuff, like their delegated proof of stake, to user guides on staking, the big picture strategy, and really importantly, how they fit into their regulatory landscape. Think FedNow integration. <laughs> right. We'll definitely get into that. And for you listening, the goal here is simple, a shortcut. We want to map out how this whole system tries to deliver crypto that's, you know, fearless, compliant, and actually easy to use. And maybe touch on what the market sees as the big potential catalysts. Exactly. What might move the needle? Okay. Let's unpack that core vision then. Yep. Metallicus, founded back in 2016 by Marshall Hayner. The sources suggest their goal from day one was a bit different, right? Not just building outside the system. Correct. It was always about building regulated infrastructure within the existing financial world, but making it feel seamless, uh, instant, easy. The idea being mass adoption needs compliance hmm. and can't feel clunky. That's the philosophy. They argue you'll never get widespread use if compliance and, frankly, good user experience are afterthoughts. The XPR network, that 2024 rebrand, really underscores the shift towards infrastructure. It leans on four core ideas to make this whole digital asset banking thing work. Okay, let's break those down. Pillar number one has to be the cost, right? Transaction fees are a huge hurdle in crypto. Absolutely. So number one, fee-less transactions. This is probably their biggest hook for everyday users. Sending transactions costs nothing for the person hitting send. Okay, but the cost doesn't just disappear. Yeah. Right, it's a blockchain. Right. Right, computing power needs to be paid for. The difference is how. Instead of you paying a gas fee that fluctuates, the cost is covered by network resources, CPU, net, RAM. These resources are provided by block producers who stake XPR. Ah, uh, so the cost is absorbed by the network operators, essentially. Mm. That does remove a big psychological barrier for the user not needing that extra gas token. Exactly. But wait, if it relies on staked resources, could the network get congested, like run out of resources if there's a massive spike in activity? Yeah. How's that managed? That's the balancing act in DPoS, delegated proof of stake. The block producers, the DPs, they have to stake enough XPR to cover the network's needs. Think of it maybe like a subscription model. The platform covers the tiny costs of each transfer because the overall activity benefits everyone. If usage spikes, BPs are incentivized to stake more to keep things running smoothly and, crucially, keep it free for the end user. Got it. Okay, pillar number two. Number two is the built-in identity layer. XPR has native KYC, know your customer, and on-chain identity verification baked right in. This is their big appeal to businesses, to regulators. It means AML, anti-money laundering compliance, is there from the start. Hmm, that's interesting. And probably a bit controversial in some crypto circles, wouldn't you say? Mandated KYC, on-chain ID. Mm -hmm. That seems to go against the grain of, you know, pseudonymous transactions that many DeFi users really value. Oh, it absolutely brings up that tension. No question. The Metallicus argument, based on what we've read, is basically, yes, you give up the total anonymity of something like Monero, but what you gain is access. Access to the established global financial system. So it's a trade-off. Usability for institutions versus pure decentralization of identity. Precisely. They're betting that for a bank or a fintech to use these crypto rails, they need that built-in compliance. It has to be instant, automatic. Okay, makes sense from that perspective. What's pillar three? Three, human-readable addresses. This is a big one for user experience. Instead of copying and pasting those long, scary strings of letters and numbers. Where you're always worried you missed a character. Exactly. You just send funds to a simple handle, like at John or at Sarah, like sending money on Venmo or Cash App. That feels like a deceptively simple but powerful change. If there's just simple names, though, how do they stop people from, like, grabbing all the good names, domain squatting, or avoid collisions? Good question. Generally, you get one when you set up your wallet. The network handles the complexity underneath, linking that easy at name to your actual cryptographic keys, which are kept safe. It makes sending money to the wrong place much, much harder. Okay, easier and safer. 
And the final pillar. And finally, number four, speed. They're aiming high here. The target is over 4,000 transactions per second. Wow, that's Visa territory. Right, that kind of throughput. It's achieved using that DPoS consensus mechanism run by the top 21 elected block producers. The goal is sub-second finality for transactions. Okay, so, fearless, compliant ID, easy addresses, and fast. That's a compelling package. But now we get to the structure underneath, which sounds a bit complex. Metallicus runs two main blockchains, XPR network and metal blockchain. Can you clear up how they're different? Yeah, this distinction is really key to understanding the whole thing. Let's use an analogy. Think of the whole Metallicus ecosystem as uh, like a high-performance car designed specifically for banking. Okay, well, I'm with you. XPR network is the layer one. It's the user interface, the dashboard, the comfy seats in the cabin. It's where you, the user, interact. Feeless transfers, the at names, their decentralized exchange, Metal X, the NFT stuff that all happens on XBR. It's optimized for everyday transactions, quick interactions. So if I'm just checking my balance, sending some crypto to a friend, I'm mostly interacting with the XPR network layer. Correct. Now, Metal Blockchain, that's the engine, the chassis, the heavy-duty stuff. It's the layer zero. Launched in 2022, it's a fork of Avalanche, and its whole purpose is enterprise-level infrastructure. Built for the big players. Exactly. Built for institutional compliance and serious scalability. Metal Blockchain supports something called subnets. Think of these as new blockchains that run in parallel, scaling independently. Each one can handle roughly 4,500 transactions per second. So you can just keep adding more lanes to the highway as needed. That's the idea. Near infinite scaling potential as more banks or institutions plug in. And running a node on this layer, validating transactions requires staking 2,000 metal tokens. It's the industrial strength backbone. Okay, that clarifies it. XPR for the users, metal blockchain for the institutions, and the heavy lifting. But how do you get into this car? What connects these two layers for the user? Ah, uh, the front door. The, the key to the whole thing is the web app wallet. This is the crucial piece that smooths over all that complexity. When you sign up once, it links your accounts on both XPR network and metal blockchain. One setup, one recovery phrase. And it uses biometrics, face ID, fingerprint for security. Your keys are stored in your phone's secure chip, the secure enclave. It feels like a modern banking app, but you still hold your own keys, which is critical in crypto. And your bath is also where MetalPay lives. Exactly. MetalPay is built right into WebAuth. It's their regulated way to get fiat currency dollars in and out of the system, at least in the U.S. It's fully KYC'd, registered as a money services business. You can link your bank, use a debit card. Basically, it bridges the crypto rails back to traditional money. Kind of like a built-in Coinbase or Cash app, but specifically for this ecosystem. You got it. A regulated hybrid right inside the main wallet. Okay, the architecture is clear now. Let's circle back to staking, because you said that's what powers the feeless system on XPR. The block producers stake to cover costs. How does staking work for regular users? What are the rewards? You mentioned two types. Right. Staking is central to the economics, and yes, two very different kinds. Let's start with the first one. Okay, first is short staking. This is tied directly to that DPoS consensus we talked about. To participate, you stake your XPR tokens, and critically, you have to vote for four block producers. Your amount of staked XPR equals your voting power, one XPR, one vote. And those votes determine the top 21 BPs who actually run the network. Correct. They're the ones validating transactions, securing everything. And what's in it for the staker? What are the rewards for doing this? You earn an APR, an annual percentage rate, this comes from network inflation, which is cap. It can't be more than 4% of the total XPR supply each year. And out of that 4%, about 1% is specifically earmarked for these short staking rewards. Is the APR fixed? No, it's variable. It depends on how much XPR is staked across the entire network. The more people stake, the lower the individual APR gets because that 1% reward pool gets split among more tokens. Dilution effect. Makes sense. Yeah. And a little tip here. The sources suggest you should actually look into the block producers you vote for. See who's active in the community, maybe contributing code. Gapradar, for example, is a well-known name that runs a BP node. Good point. Do your homework before you vote. What if you want your tokens back? Unstaking is pretty quick, just 24 hours. Okay, that's short staking. Now, the second type sounds different. Long staking. You said it's more like a value protection feature. Tied to Bitcoin's Satoshi value? That sounds unusual. It is unusual and yeah. quite innovative. This long staking is designed to incentivize holding XPR long term, but also to offer some protection against uh, volatility relative to Bitcoin. 
It works by recording the Satoshi value of XPR, its price in Bitcoin when you lock your tokens up. This value is tracked by decentralized price oracles. Okay, so it's pegged to BTC, not USD. Exactly. And there are two lockup periods, 90 days and 365 days. Minimum stake is 100 XPR. All right, walk me through the 90-day version. How does the protection work? For the 90-day cycle, it's fairly straightforward. If, when your stake unlocks after 90 days, the Satoshi value of XPR has gone down compared to when you started. So XPR underperformed Bitcoin during that time. Right. If that happens, you receive extra XPR tokens. Enough bonus XPR to bring the total Satoshi value of your unlocked stake back up to what it was when you initially locked it. Huh. So it protects your downside relative to Bitcoin. What if XPR outperforms Bitcoin? Then you just get your original stake back, no bonus tokens. You benefited from the price increase relative to BTC already. Interesting. So you're essentially hedging against XPR, losing ground to Bitcoin, but you give up potential extra gains if it does really well relative to BTC in exchange for that safety net. That's a good way to put it. It's about capital preservation against Bitcoin's movements. Now, the 365-day cycle adds a little twist. Okay. It's similar, but the protection, the extra XPR tokens only kicks in if the Satoshi value drops below 106% of the value recorded when you stake. Wait, below 106%? Why not just below 100% like the 90-day? Why the extra 6% buffer? The thinking seems to be that over a longer period, like a year, you expect a bit more natural fluctuation. That 6% buffer means XPR has to underperform Bitcoin by a slightly larger margin before the compensation kicks in. It focuses the protection on more significant drops, not just minor volatility. So it tolerates a small amount of underperformance over the longer term. Seems that way. And one more benefit of staking we shouldn't forget. It can significantly cut your trading fees on their ProtonQuark DAX. If you stake a lot, like 10 million XPR, your trading fees drop from 0.3% down to zero. Wow, free trading for large stakers. That's a serious incentive. Okay, let's shift gears to real world traction and uh, the regulatory side. That FedNow certification you mentioned earlier sounds huge, especially for a US focused compliance play. Why is that badge so important? It's massive. FedNow is the Federal Reserve's own system for instant payments between banks in the US, real time $247 movement, Metallicus being certified as one of the very first crypto firms recognized as a FedNow service provider, that's a major strategic win. What does that mean practically? It means they are positioned as a ready-made, regulated bridge for traditional finance. If a bank wants to use crypto rails, maybe stablecoins for faster, cheaper settlements instead of the old, slow systems, they don't have to figure out all the compliance themselves. So they can just plug into Metallicus. Exactly. They can connect to the Metallicus infrastructure, knowing it's already vetted, meets Fed requirements, supports standards like ISO 2022. It's basically offering compliant crypto plumbing for banks. That's powerful positioning. Building the rails with the regulator's stamp of approval. What about actual usage? Are people using the network? The numbers are growing. Sources mention the network has passed 700,000 unique accounts. Considering the built-in KYC, that's pretty solid organic growth. Okay, 700K accounts. Yeah. But this brings us to the market debate, right? The, the sources talk about a big disconnect between adoption or value locked and the actual market price, a valuation asymmetry. Yeah, this is where the bulls get excited. Look at total value locked, or TVL, the amount of money active in their DeFi apps. XPR Network's TVL is around $69.3 million. Now, compare that to, say, XRP Ledger, a major name, whose TVL is about $101.5 million. Okay, so XPR has maybe, what, 68% of XRP Ledger's TVL? Roughly, yeah. Significant value locked. But then look at market caps. XPR Network's market cap is tiny compared to XRP's, like, 11,000. One, one thousandth with over two thirds the TVL. That is a huge gap. It's massive. The argument is that the market just hasn't caught up, maybe due to the old Proton branding confusion, maybe because building enterprise infrastructure takes time before the value is widely recognized. But the utility, the locked value, seems way out of sync with the price, according to these analyses. That kind of gap definitely suggests room for a re-rating if things click, especially with that FedNow angle attracting institutional interest. Hmm. What's coming up on the roadmap that could help close that gap? They're still focused on removing friction. Near term, looking at late 2025, they want to roll out their own fiat on-ramp directly in the web auth wallet. So direct card purchases in the US, Australia, New Zealand, making it even easier to get money in. Lowering the barrier to entry. Exactly. Further out into 2026, there's the A-chain upgrade for the Metal blockchain. That's about making those subnets, those parallel chains, talk to each other more easily. Super stack, 
interoperability is the term they use, and ongoing security improvements, like a planned biometric key recovery system, make losing access even harder. Okay, so putting it all together, what's the main takeaway for someone listening trying to understand this whole ecosystem? I think the key is seeing XPR network, not just as a token, but as this whole integrated stack, web auth, XPR, metal blockchain, metal pay. It's all built on the idea that compliance and ease of use aren't optional extras. They have to go together. And they've managed to build something that's feelless for users, has that institutional grade backend, and crucially, has pathways into the traditional financial system like FedNow. Precisely. They're aiming to be a highly regulated, highly scalable alternative for enterprises that want to use blockchain, but need it to fit within existing rules. That strategic positioning seems pretty unique in the current landscape, especially as regulations tighten globally. It really does. The whole XPR network experience is designed to feel smooth, like a modern fintech app. But under the hood, it's built to connect to things like FedNow. So the big question for you, the listener, is this. How long can that huge valuation gap persist? The gap between its locked value and its market price, especially compared to competitors, given this intense focus on institutional compliance and that feelless user experience. So that's definitely something to think about as we watch the space evolve. Thanks for walking us through all that detail. Really appreciate the deep dive. My pleasure. Always interesting to dig into these systems.